afternoon and welcome uh, to our Preserve New York uh, grant program webinar for 2024. We're off to a great start because I can see it says 2023 on my screen. Um, if I have any architects in attendance, I want you to know that we are pleased to be offering one and a half continuing education credits for architects through the New York State De Education Department. So if you are an architect in attendance who would like to take advantage of that, please let me know either by email or through the chat. And I would be happy to get you a uh, certificate so that you can uh, maintain your license and um, use that for your uh, reporting procedures. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing afterwards. So you will get the link in a follow-up email from me in the next couple of days. The Preserve New York Grant Program is a partnership, a re-grant partnership with the New York State Council on the Arts and the Preservation League of New York State with a generous additional funding from the Robert David Lyon Gardner Foundation for projects on Long Island. So I would like to thank our funders for this partnership. Um, this grant program has been around since 1993 and we're extremely proud of it. And so let's get started and learn about uh, what you can get funded through Preserve New York. If you're not familiar with the Preservation League of New York State, uh, we are the statewide nonprofit working for historic preservation since 1974. We, were, uh, we are located in Albany, but working all over the state, serving all 62 counties. We envision a New York state where our diverse heritage is valued and protected. We lead advocacy, economic development, and education programs across the state. You can find our programs uh, largely on our website. Uh, we are also out in the community um, with uh, workshops and webinars like this one. Uh, we collaborate with our local colleagues across the state. And uh, these are your regional historic preservation organizations such as Preservation Buffalo Niagara, Preservation Long Island, and many organizations in between. And um, we work with our colleagues to empower communities to use historic preservation uh, to protect their historic resources and to be sure uh, that historic preservation always has a seat at the table when it comes to uh, economic development and smart, sustainable growth. Uh, public policy initiatives and advocacy is also part of our work. Uh, we work at the state and federal level to ensure um, that historic preservation is considered in laws and uh, bills that affect uh, development and economic development. We provide technical services. This is through um, information on our website and uh, through visits to communities all across the state where we um, advise people on historic preservation and uh, help empower everyone to use preservation in their communities. We have our Seven to Save program. This shines a light on endangered properties. Every two years, we invite nominations to our Seven to Save program. So if you're aware, of a historic resource that is endangered and just not uh, getting enough public attention or not attracting the kinds of help that it needs, uh, give us a call and perhaps uh, we'll uh, invite you to nominate uh, for our Seven to Safe program. We also provide grants and that's what we're here to talk about today. Uh, excellence Awards once a year, uh, we recognize excellent projects, individuals and organizations working for preservation across the state. Um, our preservation book club is um, held online and it's a whole lot of fun. It's a nice way to frame preservation in a number of ways um, with socially relevant con content. Um, the uh, discussions are always fascinating and I hope you'll join us for that. And finally, we do give scholarships to promising young uh, preservationists or maybe not so young, um, but uh, if you know someone who is a student of historic preservation at a New York State um, Organiz uh, organization, college or university, uh, send them our ways. $2,500 scholarships we award every year uh, for preservation students. All right, so let's talk about Preserve New York grants. Uh, this partnership 
re-grant with the New York State Council on the Arts funds uh, for specific project types. Preserve New York uh, helps fund preservation planning projects. These are historic structure reports, cultural and historic landscape reports, cultural resource surveys, and condition reports. This program funds reports only and will not fund capital repairs, construction costs, architectural plans and specs, schematic designs or construction documents. It's important to understand what aspects of preservation planning and uh, preparation for capital uh, projects that we do and do not fund. I invite everyone, uh, now that I've delved into uh, the beginning of our guidelines, if you would like to follow along with the grant guidelines, I've placed a link in the chat uh, to our 2024 Preserve New York grant guidelines. So feel free to pull those up. You can follow right along with me. And if you have questions about any of the topics that I'm covering today, please feel free to put those questions in the Q&A or the chat. And I will pause periodically to address those. All right, so our maximum grant awards range from $5,000 to $20,000 approximately. So um, it's Preserve New York is pretty flexible in the amount of money that it funds. Uh, every project is different. These projects um, uh, can be uh, pretty large projects uh, that are phased. So if you find yourself with a project um, like a historic structure report or a cultural landscape report, or even a cultural resource survey that uh, is going to be pretty extensive and end up costing um, a lot of money. You can phase these projects and come to us a uh, year after year to, uh, to uh, fund portions of it. So keep that in mind. You can phase your projects. If you have questions about your grant strategy, uh, you can always give us a call. We're really happy to talk to you about your projects and learn about them and uh, help you determine how best to uh, apply for Preserve New York for these larger projects. Um, keep in mind that uh, you are responsible for a minimum 20% cash match. And what that means is that if you, you are looking at a $20,000 project, you can uh, request up to 80% of that from Preserve New York, and you will have to provide 20% of it in the form of a cash match. And we'll talk about that more later when we go over um, the budgets that you need to provide in your application. So who can apply for Preserve New York? Preserve New York grants are open to 501c3 nonprofit arts and cultural organizations located in New York State. Municipalities in New York State can apply as well, but only for cultural resource surveys. And uh, the resources and buildings that are eligible for Preserve New York include uh, historic buildings and resources with a primary arts and cultural purpose. And uh, this is for the site-specific projects. So when I mention site-specific projects, we're talking about historic structure reports, cultural landscape reports, and condition reports. The building or resource must be owned by a 501c3 nonprofit organization or municipality. And then the applicant must either own the building or have a long-term lease stewardship agreement or MOA with the owner. But again, the owner needs to be a 501c3 nonprofit or a municipality. We cannot fund privately owned properties. We cannot fund religious organizations uh, such as congregations. If you have a former church, it needs to be owned by a 501c3 or a municipality in order for us to fund its preservation. Uh, we also cannot fund state-owned properties or properties owned by any other kind of nonprofit organization, such as 501c4s, 501c13s, and the like. Every year, uh, we focus on a few funding priorities. Um, for 2024, our Preserve New York funding priorities are as follows. Again, you can find these in the grant guidelines discussed in a little more detail. Um, but these priorities speak to the mission of the New York State Council on the Arts and the Preservation League of New York State. And uh, the things that we are trying to address specifically in historic preservation this year. So for all projects, um, this includes cultural resource surveys and the site specific projects. We're looking specifically for projects that identify and preserve histories, place 
and culture associated with underrepresented communities. You will find a definition of underrepresented communities in on page two of your grant guidelines. We're looking also for projects that address issues of social justice, diversity, equity, access, and inclusion. And finally, projects that address challenges created by climate change. If your project meets uh, any of these priorities, um, great. And if not, you can still apply. These are simply priorities. There will be questions on your application pertaining to these priorities. Um, please answer them. Honestly, if you're not sure if your project does any of these things, you can always give us a call and we can discuss. Um, for cultural resource surveys specifically, uh, we are looking for projects that include buildings or sites with a primary arts and cultural purpose. We're also looking for applicants that are arts and cultural organizations. Municipalities can apply. Any 501c3 nonprofit can apply for a cultural resource surveys, but these are the, the uh, priorities for this year. If you have any questions about any of this, you're welcome to call me and uh, we could discuss. Last year, uh, we funded 19 Preserve New York projects across New York State in 17 counties. Uh, these were distributed from Long Island to Jamestown and everywhere in between. Uh, we funded uh, to the tune of just under $280,000 in Preserve New York grants, and three of those projects were on Long Island and eligible for Gardner funds, which made our grant funding go even further across the state. So I mentioned that we fund uh, four specific project types through Preserve New York. Let's talk about those projects and what they might um, entail. So condition reports are a comprehensive condition analysis of a structure, building, or resource. Uh, this is a top to bottom, inside and out look at the existing conditions of your resource. Um, if you have uh, particular concerns with your building or resource and these reports can be tailored to fit the, uh, the building's uh, specific needs and issues. Uh, these are usually uh, completed by a preservation architect or preservation engineer, and this provides a document for your organization to use for planning the preservation of your resource. Uh, this can be a useful document uh, to be used for years to come uh, as a maintenance schedule. It uh, should include prioritized recommendations for repairs and uh, rehabilitation of your building. If you are planning to uh, change the use of um, the space in your building, or if you're looking at feasibility um, of using certain spaces uh, in your building for other uses, then this can be a useful document for you as well. Historic structure reports are a lot like a building condition report, but they have an extra element of historic research that goes into them. So um, you're looking at a, an existing conditions report of your building with um, a historical background of the building's architectural history, its um, occupational history, who lived there, who built it, who was the architect. Um, it can tell you a lot of useful things for interpreting your building to public. So this is particularly useful for historic house museums or any historic site where you're talking about the history of the building itself. It can also be useful if you have a, a building with a complicated architectural history where it's been changed over the years, built onto, parts of it torn down, parts of it changed or altered. Um, it can help you understand those changes and can guide your efforts to preserve or restore your building. Um, this uh, comprehensive uh, comprehensive report uh, can serve um, as a roadmap for a um, master preservation plan for your building. It can also help with historical interpretation of your building. Um, on your screen here, uh, this example um, is the Rare Center uh, for Immigrant Culture and History in Kingston, New York. And you can see that they have received Preserve New York grants twice for uh, and both times for historic structure reports. So it's possible that over time your report would need to be updated. And this is indeed the case uh, with the Rare Center. Um, they started out with a vacant building 
that had once been a Jewish bakery. And uh, the Jewish Federation of Ulster County said, we have to preserve this building. It's got an important history. And in fact, we should turn it into a museum. I can remember uh, the early days of their planning and how excited they were to get started. They applied for a Preserve New York grant in 2010 for a historic structure report. And that was the starting element of their rehabilitation and uh, public interpretation of this building as a museum. Uh, the Rare Center for Immigrant Culture and History was formed and they came back to us 11 years later for an update to their historic structure report. They had more of an idea of what they wanted to do with their building, how they wanted the organization um, to form and to grow. And they were able to get an update to that historic structure report to guide their efforts moving forward. Now, since then, uh, the Rare Center has uh, received a number of grants from the Preservation League of New York State, uh, most recently a technical assistance grant for an accessibility study, a technical assistance grant for a hazmat remediation study in their upper floors so that they can begin to rehabilitate and use those spaces. So um, their grants have built one upon another and led to um, quite a bit of forward momentum uh, for the Rare Center. Uh, they most recently received a uh, $469,000 Environmental Protection Fund grant um, for uh, building rehabilitation efforts. So we're always happy to see um, organizations that start with these preservation planning grants uh, get their historic structure report or condition report to show them the way, and then they use that to leverage um, more funding down the road uh, as uh, their project progresses. So congratulations to the Rare Center. We're super proud to be part of their story. Another fun uh, example of a condition report awarded uh, recently, it was in 2022, uh, uh, we awarded a Preserve New York grant to the Gowanda Historic Hollywood Theater, um, specifically for the building next to the theater. So you can see in the photo, uh, the theater on the left, and then in the foreground, is the Gowanda Cooperative Saving and Loan Building. And they had purchased this building uh, to preserve it and to provide supportive space for the spectacular Hollywood Theater next door. Um, they uh, started out with a technical assistance grant in 2015 uh, for a feasibility reuse study of this building. They wanted to see what they could do with it. It's spectacular inside, it's open, um, it's an old bank, and it's got a lot of features uh, that they'd like to preserve, a lot of historic features, but they wanted to see how best to reuse this building. So um, they followed up that TAG grant with another one in 2017 for an accessibility study. When they came back to us in 2022 to apply for Preserve New York for a building condition report, they were proud to show what they had done with their previous studies. This is important. If you have gotten uh, Preserve New York or technical assistance grants in the past and are looking to apply again, be prepared uh, to show us what you've done as a result of those previous uh, grant funded studies. In this case, as soon as I got out of my car, they said, you've got to come over and see our accessibility, uh, our accessible entrance on the side of the building. And that's what you see here in the photo. Uh, they started their project with accessibility in mind. And they put that 2017 TAD grant uh, to good use to plan where to put their accessible entrance and how to build it. And indeed they raised funds and got it done. And now they're ready for an overall building condition report so that they can begin rehabilitations of the interior of the building. So um, it's a, 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 a way <laughs> forward um, to be successful in obtaining more grants. You, like, you should be able to show what you've done with previous grants. This is really important. Uh, so I like to use that example when I can. Cultural landscape reports are another project type that we fund through Preserve New York. Um, in the picture, you see Oneida Community Mansion House with their extensive gardens. Um, they applied uh, just last year for a cultural historic landscape report um, for their gardens. Now their project uh, centers on expanding uh, the stories that they tell um, through their landscape surrounding the mansion house. Um, so they are um, undertaking a number of projects here. And uh, this is something to keep in mind uh, 
when you're thinking about applying for a Preserve New York grant, uh, have an overarching plan in mind. Uh, the Oneida Community Mansion House has projects going on uh, on the mansion itself, uh, roof uh, rehabilitation and other facade projects, uh, but they're also looking to historical interpretation out um, in the landscape. So uh, they have just wrapped up phase one of a 10-year multi-phase $10 million plan uh, to preserve and protect the mansion house and uh, to expand their historical interpretation to the gardens. Um, so we've, again, we've been happy uh, to be part of the story. They've received a number of grants from us over the years and uh, this latest one will help them look out to the landscape and draw in stories, not just of the, uh, the, uh, people who lived um, in the community mansion house, the people who built it. Uh, but looking back even further to the Oneida community or the Oneida Indian nation uh, that lived on this land originally, there are still elements of um, that population and they want to tell that story a little uh, more thoroughly. So this cultural landscape report um, will inform that. Uh, most cultural landscape reports also um, inform accessibility efforts around the site and other initiatives to improve visitor experience. Uh, so these can be uh, pretty extensive and extremely important documents for an organization to have uh, for their long-term plans. Another example of um, the leveraging of our grant funds for, um, for more uh, funding opportunities is at Old Westbury Gardens in Nassau County. So back in 2007, they applied for a Preserve New York grant for a historic landscape report. Um, many years later, 10 years later, uh, they turned their attention back to um, their building uh, with a building condition report. They have a number of outbuildings at their gardens. So, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago in 2021, they received a technical assistance grant to look um, at the condition of their thatched cottage and how best to uh, preserve the thatched roof of that cottage. Um, but in 2022, uh, they received a $200,000 uh, EPF grant uh, for the restoration of their boxwood garden. And uh, that 2007 cultural landscape report helped inform uh, their plans for their gardens and they were able to um, proceed with their plans uh, with that state grant. So we like to see that kind of planning and progress. Cultural resource surveys uh, are the fourth type of project that we fund through Preserve New York. Um, a cultural resource survey is quite different than the, uh, the three project types I just covered. Um, this is not a site specific project, but more of a wide ranging inventory of historic resources, either in a neighborhood or a municipality or some other defined area. Um, a cultural resource survey can help determine the historic significance of an area, uh, look at architectural styles, patterns of uh, development, and um, oftentimes lays the groundwork for the creation of a historic district, whether a local historic district or a state and national register district. Uh, these projects are often phased. Um, the beginnings of a cultural resource survey are to get a general idea of the kinds of historic resources present and uh, to define the project area and look at the um, themes or um, architectural styles that might be uh, present uh, to go for a, a National Register um, Historic uh, District nomination. So uh, we have funded cultural resource surveys in one, two, or three phases. Um, this uh, latest one from last year was uh, um, a, uh, awarded to the Historic District Council in New York City for a cultural resource survey of the Little Caribbean neighborhood in Brooklyn. And this survey will focus on not just the built environment, but the cultural environment too. We're excited to see how this one plays out and um, excited to see the history of this neighborhood documented through a cultural resource survey. Also last year, we awarded uh, the Fullerton Center for Culture and History um, 
a Preserve New York grant to re-examine uh, the boundaries of their East End Historic District in Newburgh. So what happens sometimes is that you get a cultural resource survey, uh, you get um, a historic district established, and a number of years later, uh, you return to uh, re-examine those boundaries and see if anything has changed. Uh, every year, uh, things get a little older and more historic. Um, and the priorities also sometimes change in um, municipalities for what they're looking to do with their uh, historic districts, whether it's access to historic tax credits or uh, historical documentation, or even planning um, for uh, uh, resiliency programs. Um, but because these priorities can change, sometimes what they're looking for in a district can change as well. So this was an update of an earlier survey. And um, so we're, we're happy to see those updates take place. I have a question. Uh, so let's pause for a moment. Uh, the question is, will a comprehensive structural and septic report created by an engineer be accepted as a condition report? Hmm. Um, unfortunately, no. Um, a septic report is not um, an allowable project uh, for Preserve New York. The structural report would be if it's a structural report pertaining to your building. So, you know, we're looking for a um, that kind of structural report, but utilities and um, septic systems, things like that are not an allowable uh, project, I'm sorry. All right. So here's a different kind of cultural uh, resource survey that we funded in 2022 um, of the public art on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So this was a survey of public art objects and installations. Um, and the reason for a survey like this is because public art uh, is often location dependent. So the art itself was uh, installed uh, in an area and the art is informed by uh, the context if that art is removed to another place, it's removed from its context. Uh, public art is often endangered by development. And in fact, the, the horses on the left in the picture, this installation was removed. And it's oftentimes uh, that kind of uh, occurrence in a community that leads to um, public alarm and a realization of the need to have a survey of these um, these works of art that sometimes are a bit vulnerable. So uh, we were happy to see this survey take place. It has been completed. And if you're interested in seeing it, you can access that survey on Landmark West's website. And I have the URL up on the screen. Um, but I urge you to check it out. It's fascinating. And it's, it's just a different kind of cultural resource survey. We had never funded anything quite like this before. I have a question too, backing up just a little bit um, to our previous slide. How many properties were in the East End Historic District Project? Good question. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I can, I can find that out for you and let you know after. All right, so I've, I've made uh, several uh, references to the leveraging of grant funds uh, through uh, Preserve New York grants, and um, uh, if you'd like to take a look at more examples, we have on our blog examples of, um, of some of these uh, success stories. So please feel free to check it out. Every year when we hear of the um, Regional Economic Development Council's grant awards, uh, we take an eager look at that list and see how many names we recognize from our own grant program. And oftentimes it's quite a few. Uh, we're always so happy <laughs> for those organizations uh, to have been able to go forward and get additional funding for their projects through um, New York State grants. Let's uh, address one more question before we move on. Um, we have the question, ten, uh, can 10 private homes by different prominent modern architects representing a significant cultural resource constitute a cultural resource survey as a first stage for the area? Hmm, it's a pretty specific question. 
um, about that cultural resource survey. We have funded surveys of the works of specific uh, architects. Uh, so, you know, focusing on um, a particular architect or group of architects, it looks like you've got a number of different uh, modern architects. That's that's a compelling project idea. Um, and I would say short answer would be yes. Uh, that kind of project you would want to be sure and um, define the project carefully so that the project isn't too cumbersome or too large or too, um, you, you wanna make sure that it's it's crystal clear what you're focusing on in this project, if that makes any sense. So if you have a number of different architects, be sure and name them, list them and indicate what they have in common. What is the common theme? In this case, it looks like modernism is, so that's a great theme. Um, so yes, that's short answer is yes. Uh, and finally, can an, or can an organization hire someone to write their grant application and then use that same person to carry out the survey? Oh, that's a good question. So what I'm hearing here is, can your consultant also be your grant writer? Maybe, yes, I believe that has happened <laughs> a time or two in the past. Um, yes, your consultant can certainly help you write your application. And that's really not a bad relationship to have. Um, I always recommend that you have open communication, early communication with your chosen consultant so that you're applying for what you both understand as the project. Um, having your uh, consultant help you with your application is absolutely acceptable um, and it can be beneficial so that you're both on the same page. Um, one thing to look out for in this case is um, don't just throw it all on your consultant and you know you want to make sure that you as the applicant that you are actively involved in the process, that you understand the application what is being asked and that you answer the questions that you need to answer because your consultant can answer questions regarding the project scope. Uh, they can help you word your project summary. Um, that can be really useful, but ultimately only you can answer the questions about your organization, your mission, uh, how your project and your mission relate to one another, et cetera. So I do encourage that sort of cooperation, but make sure you're actively involved in the process as well. So I hope that answers your question. All right. So I have a couple more examples of how um, the Preservation Leagues grants can build one upon the other and help uh, show the way forward for complex projects or complex sites. In this case, uh, the Seward House Museum in, in Cayuga County in Auburn, uh, they've got a number of projects on the table. They have their mansion house that has its own needs. Uh, they have a barn and carriage house out back that were being underutilized and they wanted to see how best to use those spaces. They also have gardens. Now not pictured here are the extensive gardens to the left of the mansion house. So you see the picture on the bottom. To the left, they've got like two acres of formal gardens out there. And um, the Seward House Museum uh, wants to uh, wanted to rehabilitate the gardens, um, restore old walkways and plantings and outbuildings that once existed out there and open it to the public as sort of an oasis in the middle of the city of Auburn. And indeed it is. I got to uh, visit last year in the heat of summer and it's glorious to walk through their open gates and stroll through their gardens in the shade and appreciate the plantings, appreciate the views of the museum house and uh, the outbuildings. It's a wonderful experience. And um, their efforts began with a cultural landscape report uh, funded by Preserve New York. Uh, it took a look at that landscape, helped show them the way forward for interpreting it, for restoring it. Um, then they turned their attention back to the mansion house with a 2017 Preserve New York grant for a condition report. And uh, in, in looking at their use of space in the museum itself, they realized they could use a little extra space, uh, some exhibit space, some collection storage space, and out back is their uh, carriage house in their barn. So with a 2020 TAG grant, they looked at a feasibility use study for those 
uh, two barns. Um, they came back the following year with $500,000 <laughs> to begin the rehabilitation of the barn and carriage house. And that project just broke ground this year. And um, the plan is to have uh, exhibit spaces back there, office space, and an improved visitor experience with um, accessible walkways. Again, uh, cultural landscape reports, feasibility reuse studies uh, can really work together and accessibility studies funded through TAG can work together to improve the overall vis visitor experience and accessibility of the site. And so it's a good example of that. So you can see the placards on the fence there um, speaking to some of the, the grants that they've received. They've received a bunch of grants from ARPA funds through the city of Auburn, uh, Save America's Treasures Grant uh, from uh, the National Park Service. That's because this is a National Historic Landmark. So uh, depending on your historic designation, you may have um, more access to um, more grant programs. This is my favorite. <laughs> I love telling this story and I told it last year, but I'll tell it again because there's been some updates. So um, this is the Tenbrook Mansion owned by the Albany County Historical Association, right smack in the middle of the city of Albany. And much like the Seward House Museum, they have a pretty large property, including an area where there were once gardens and uh, including some outbuildings that are just no longer there. So uh, They've had a long list of grants from us over the years, starting back in 2015 with a technical assistance grant, uh, looking at their building. And I believe the focus of that was water infiltration. Uh, they were having some issues on the inside of their building because of water infiltration. They needed to get to the bottom of it. Um, that building condition survey led to a historic structure report, which is a more comprehensive look at the building. So instead of just focusing on the water infiltration issue, uh, that report focused on the oh, all the spaces in the museum building, and um, they were looking to expand their interpretation of the people who once lived and worked um, in the mansion. So the historic structure report helped them to create that uh, new interpretive plan for the space and also gave them an idea of the overall existing conditions of the mansion. So one of the recommendations going all the way back to 2015 after their uh, water infiltration um, uh, assessment, uh, the one of the recommendations was to get a cultural landscape report because they were going to need to change the way the land drained around uh, the mansion. Specifically, water was running toward the foundation rather than away from it. And before they start digging, they wanted to make sure that they were not uh, going to destroy any of the um, historic um, integrity of the landscape. Plus, they really wanted to take a better look at the land around the mansion and see how they could better interpret the gardens and uh, improve uh, access to the mansion. If you've never seen this place, it sits high up on a hill um, and it's a little hard to get to sometimes. It's a kind of hard to figure it out. And once you park, you walk in from the back of the property toward the back of the house, and it's a beautiful walk. But I suppose it could be confusing if you're not sure where to enter the mansion or where to get your tickets for a tour. Um, I know that, uh, you know, as part of their cultural landscape report, uh, they weren't just looking um, at how to fix their water, water infiltration problem and access to the site. They were also looking at how visitors use their site. Um, how people interacted with the landscape. And uh, they found that visitors really weren't paying much attention to the gardens because they weren't sure they were allowed to. <laughs> and, you know, that's a problem. That's a barrier, right, to your audience. You want to make sure that people feel welcome on your site and that they understand what parts of the museum are intended uh, for interaction. So they had a number of issues that they wanted to solve. And their cultural landscape report gave them um, a starting point and a, a roadmap forward for um, vast improvements to the site. One of the things that the Cultural Landscape Report uncovered for um, the Albany County Historical Association was um, the footprint of what once had been a carriage house out back of the museum. And you can see that 
um, dilapidated barn down in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. That was their carriage house. And it used to sit, if you look at the uh, map in the middle of your screen, you can see that it sat off to the side just behind um, the mansion. And that map also shows the old walkways and driveways around the mansion. So these are things that they wanted to restore. And um, the cultural landscape report helped them create a plan for doing that. Um, so the feasibility reuse study, which was the focus of their TAG grant in 2021, was looking at the feasibility of reconstructing the carriage house as a visitor center. They had um, some of the foundation still left in the ground and other features associated with that carriage house. And they wanted to see if they could uh, utilize all of that to reconstruct this and make it uh, a much needed visitor center. Um, so they were able to uh, apply through the CFA for environmental protection funds in 2021, and they got them $283,000 uh, for their stabilization and accessibility project. Accessibility um, meaning um, accessibility to the site, improved parking areas, improved walking areas, improved wayfinding, and a visitor center in 2023. Um, they were awarded almost $120,000 um, to acquire a little more of their historic landscape and for planning and restoration of that landscape. So we're so excited to see this project moving forward with big grants from the state uh, to allow it to, uh, to come to fruition. And it all started with a little tag grant back in 2015. So, um, and finally, the Hudson Athens Lighthouse. I, I have to mention this. What a complex site. Uh, this a lighthouse sits out in the middle of the Hudson River. Um, it is uh, being endangered by a number of things, by the weather, uh, exposure out in the middle of the river, but also water currents are undermining its foundation. So in 2021, things were looking so dire uh, for the Hudson Athens Lighthouse that they nominated um, the site for seven to save. And we listed them on our seven to save list in 2020. Uh, they came to us for a tag grant that same year for a structural analysis. And uh, that $4,000 grant illuminated some issues that they needed to take a closer look at and gave them an idea of priorities for stabilizing the lighthouse. In 2021, um, a building condition report followed. And um, some of these reports focused on the brick building itself, some focused on this stone foundation, you can see just below it, and then um, a condition report in 2023 focused on the soil conditions beneath the water where the pilings go into the earth and uh, you know to help them plan for their stabilization of the underwater aspect of the foundation. So uh, this required, uh, you know, looking at a number of issues and to try to determine how best to start and um, and complete this project. So in 2021, uh, they were awarded a half a million dollars uh, to restore and repair the lighthouse. So this focused on um, the lighthouse itself and some much needed um, restorations that needed to happen there. And then uh, in 2023, so the timing of this is interesting and as you probably know, if you've ever written grants that kind of depended on each other for a project, um, sometimes you have to keep your fingers crossed when you apply for one grant and you have another one that's applied for, but you don't know if you've gotten it yet. So in 2023, they applied for a TAG grant. Um, that would have been August of that year. Uh, before they applied for the TAG grant, they applied for an EPF grant for half a million dollars for under million, or underwater uh, foundation restoration and their electrical system upgrade, um, both of which were addressed through TAG grants in 2022 and in 2023 after the fact. So um, things worked out, the stars aligned and their technical assistance grants funded reports that informed uh, how to put that half a million dollars to the very best use possible in restoring the underwater foundation and upgrading their antiquated electrical system. So it's really nice when things work out that way, um, but it's not just luck. <laughs> They're not just lucky here, they have a good plan. And that's something that I hope that you'll take away from today's webinar, that having a good plan for your building or resource 
is so important. If you can let us in on that plan a little bit and show us how a Preserve New York grant will, um, will facilitate your plan, how it fits in, uh, why it's timely uh, for your plan, then you will have a much better chance of getting funded. So uh, that's one thing all these sites have in common, by the way, the ones where you see a laundry list of grants from us and you think, why are they getting all the grants from, you know, partially because they have a, a really good plan. And these are not large organizations. They don't have a ton of employees. Um, you can do this, even in an all volunteer organization, um, getting your board on board, getting everybody together and coming up with a good plan. You know, it may not go exactly as you plan, but if you at least know where you're going and know how these grants will fit in together, uh, then that can show us that uh, that our Preserve New York grant funded uh, document isn't just going to sit on a shelf and gather dust. Um, all right. So the last example I have for you, this is a neat example because oftentimes I hear from people and organizations about a building that they would like to save, but they don't know how to obtain the building. Um, you know, it can cost a lot of money to buy a building, even if it's endangered and, um, and vacant. So this is a case where the Center for Photography in Woodstock uh, had its eye on this former cigar factory. And um, the Center for Photography at Woodstock is a, an arts organization that's dedicated to supporting artists working in photography and related media. They need a lot of space to provide the things they provide for artists. Um, they are community-based, uh, based, artist-centered, and um, their collaborative programming is at the heart of their mission. So again, you wanna make sure that your use of your building um, is uh, consistent with your mission. Uh, the tools and opportunities that they provide to artists and creative workers um, include access to equipment and workspace, artist residences, exhibition opportunities, and public conversation uh, around critical issues related to photography in a rapidly changing world. So they've got a pretty broad mission um, focused on photography, obviously, but they provide a lot of things. They need a lot of space. I'm not sure where they were working out of before, but this building um, is essential to them being able to continue their mission. So um, a, another question, uh, aside from obtaining a building for your organization that I get pretty often is, well, we have our eyes on this building but we don't really know its condition and we don't know what we're in for. If we um, either accept this building as a gift or purchase it with um, through fundraising, what if it's, it's such bad condition that we can't rehabilitate it? Um, unfortunately, we can't allow you to apply for a condition report until you either own or lease the building. Um, so that puts applicants in a bit of a pickle sometimes. They're not sure if they should take the chance and either accept that building as a gift, which I've heard, you know, is the case with some organizations, they've been offered a building and they're like, oh, I don't know if this is a gift or not, because it's gonna cost us a lot of money to rehabilitate it. Um, but in this case, um, the Center for Photography applied for an Empire State Development Grant to obtain the building first. And I, you know, they took that chance, they got the grant in 2022 and they were able to purchase this building. So, so excited. They got the building, they got the deed to it, they own it. And they came to us immediately for a Preserve New York grant for a condition report. Um, and that condition report will provide that master preservation plan that they need uh, to rehabilitate those spaces and continue their mission in this fabulous building. So good for them. Um, that's, that's one way to obtain a building, Empire State Development. All right. So who knew? I'm sure somebody knew, but uh, I thought it was pretty brilliant myself. All right, so I hope you're excited about applying for a Preserve New York grant. I hope you're giving lots of thought uh, to some of the examples here and some of the lessons that organizations have learned in um, putting grants together and making projects happen. But before you decide to apply, um, please consider a couple of fundamental things. Uh, so primarily, how does your potential project fit in 
with your organization's mission and strategic plan. You should have a strategic plan. If you don't have a strategic plan, at least know uh, what your plan will be moving forward. Um, because our grants are for preservation planning projects, um, our grants fund um, documents for you to use as a roadmap and a way forward with your building, um, you should have at least an idea of what you're going to do once you get that. So you get the Preserve New York grant, you're so excited, you got the grant, um, then you get your document from your architect. What now? Well, I can tell you what now. Fundraising, that's what. Um, you know, this is going to have to move forward one way or another. You're going to need money in order to implement the recommendations that are made in your condition report or your historic structure report. Um, so make sure that your organization is able to undertake the fundraising campaign. And make sure that you have uh, the ability to apply for grants, but also to do private fundraising because grants alone are not gonna cover all your costs. Even those big state grants, often require uh, matches. So you need to know, at least plan for how you're going to make that happen. Um, Preserve New York grants are meant to proceed pretty major projects. So if you're not ready to undertake these things yet, take a step back, consider applying for a technical assistance grant instead, because that is a one-off little project. You get a recommendation, you implement it. This, uh, you know, Preserve New York grants are preparation for much larger, more comprehensive projects. All right, so when you're thinking about uh, capital projects, um, be sure you're ready uh, to undertake the complete project from beginning to end. Now I've divided up this list of planning um, points uh, the first three things at the top of this list, the condition assessment, the planning study, and capital project prioritization and fundraising prep, those are all things that you will get in your Preserve New York grant funded report. So you start with those from your PNY grant. You have your, you know the condition of your building, uh, you've got that planning study under your belt, and you can show that to potential funders and say, look, we know exactly what needs to happen to this building. We've had an expert come in and assess it. And we've got um, project prioritization in place. We know what to do and we're ready to fundraise. Um, but be sure in addition to fundraising that you're able to oversee this project. You want to be an active um, participant in this project. You want to make sure that you're not just pushing it off on your contractor and expecting them to do what they should be doing. Um, be sure you're ready to cover some soft costs. So for instance, plans and spec specifications are not included in your Preserve New York grant. So that's going to have to be something that you will have to fund yourselves um, before your project is able to get off the ground. Uh, if you need to prepare bidding documents, make sure you do that. Um, look to hire qualified building professionals. That is so much easier said than done. I just got a call this morning from an architect asking if I know of any qualif qualified historic preservation contractors in our area. Um, they're aging out. It's it's hard to find uh, qualified contractors, but they are out there. They're busy, but they exist. Um, make sure that you're willing to put in the work and, and really hire the right person for the job. Don't just go for the lowest bid or whoever is um, whoever is handy. Um, be sure and oversee your project from the beginning to the end. Uh, there are lots of things, permits, things that need to be tied up. Um, and you also want to make sure that you're um, promoting your project in the community. If you want to be able to fundraise effectively, you need community support. And you'll find questions pertaining to that in your Preserve New York application. Part of um, what we're trying to do with Preserve New York is provide you a preservation planning study, but also help prepare you for the, the kinds of um, relationships that you're going to have to develop in the community to effectively fundraise for your project. So these are all things you need to be thinking about, not to overwhelm you, but these are things that uh, should go into your consideration of when it's the right time to apply for a Preserve New York grant. When you're ready, um, here's how to apply. 
So the very first thing you should do is read the guidelines. Again, I have in the chat um, uh, the link to our guidelines online. Please feel free to um, please, please read them. Please share them with your consultant. Uh, they do say what we fund and what we don't fund. So, you know, it's always a little heartbreaking to receive a uh, scope of work in a grant application that includes a whole bunch of things that we can't fund. Um, some things we can, sometimes we can tease them out and just say, okay, we'll fund everything except for these things. Sometimes we can't. Uh, that's why we require a pretty detailed scope of work and we'll go over that in a moment. Um, but be sure you and your consultant are familiar with the guidelines. Um, once you've read the guidelines, it's time to fill out the pre-application that's available on our website. Uh, the pre-application establishes eligibility, your eligibility to apply, the eligibility of your resource, and the eligibility of your project. If everything checks out, then I send you the link to the full application. Um, in the meantime, be sure that uh, you're talking with consultants and choose the one who is most qualified for your project. Um, if you have questions about that, uh, you can always call and ask. You can ask me anything. Give me a call if you have questions about any of this. Um, but be sure that you're going with a consultant who's well qualified for the kind of project that you're looking to do. Um, be sure you and your consultant are, are able to communicate well and are on the same page with your project so that your application um, will agree with what they're agreeing uh, to do as far as the work on the project. Um, you will need to submit photos of your building. So we require at least five, no more than 10 photos. Uh, so be sure that you're showing us an overall view of your building and then narrow in on the um, areas of concern. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the examples that I provided earlier uh, with the, the Seward Mansion in Auburn, I had looked at a number of grant applications from them. I hadn't visited yet. Uh, and I was not aware of the, the layout of their property or the context of their museum. I did not realize they were located in the smack dab center of the city. Um, it, not their fault. I mean, they their grant applications are great all the time. But just keep in mind that our panelists who review your applications and the Preservation League staff may not be super familiar with your site. So be sure and show us the site's context. If you are located out in the country in a rural setting, show us that. If you're located in an urban setting, please show us that. Don't assume that we know that. Um, maybe we should, but if we don't, um, your, your photos will definitely help. So, um, you know, be sure and take photos that really show uh, the context and uh, the areas of concern of, of your building. Um, preview your application. Um, you can do that. I will show you how in a moment. Uh, before you start filling it out, preview the whole thing so you know what to expect and what we're going to be asking of you. Um, compile your needed attachments ahead of time. So if you have a folder on your desktop with all your attachments in it, boy, that makes it super easy when you get to the end of your application and start uploading um, your documents and your photos. So that's a, that's something you can do ahead of time. It can it can be a procrastination thing. <laughs> you know, if you tend to procrastinate, work on that document folder for a while and just start compiling your attachments. Um, fairly painless task, but it will save you some work later. All right, so I have a question real quick. Let's put a pause on how to apply and go back looking at cultural resource surveys. So I have a question about um, cultural resource surveys for a historic district. Is property owner approval for each building required? No, um, to apply for a Preserve New York grant, um, that is not required. Um, the State Historic Preservation Office may have their own requirements, um, but we do not require uh, property owner approval. So you can look at a district, say, you know, this is what we're proposing to do. These are our boundaries. And, um, and so no, a lot of the things that I talk about in this webinar regarding um, ownership of properties uh, and the, uh, the accepted properties for projects are for site specific projects. For surveys, the rules are a little different. Um, you know, be sure and look at your uh, guidelines if you're not really sure. Now, property owner approval is not covered in our guidelines. So, um, 
you know, that was a, that was a good question. There are no bad questions. Um, but, um, uh, but uh, yeah, that's not, that's not required. So I'll make your application a little easier. All right. So you'll know, be sure and preview your application, compile your attachments, and then finally just submit it by the deadline. Um, we cannot accept any materials after the deadline. So please keep that in mind. Um, you will find, uh, you know, certain documents that you need to attach, such as support letters. They're optional. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but we cannot accept those after the fact. So once you hit submit, you're done. <laughs> you're done. Do not email me things after the fact because I can't accept them. I might take them, but I can't add them to your application. Okay, so there's nothing that I can do to alter your application once it's submitted. And there's nothing you can do to alter it either. So be sure you're sure that you're ready to hit submit before you hit submit. All right. Um, support letters, though, uh, one, uh, one thing we can do, we can accept support letters that are mailed to our office in Albany as long as they're postmarked by the application deadline. Okay. If you have any questions about that, you can certainly feel free to ask. All right, so let's take a, a little closer look at the application process and what you need to know. Um, so be sure you read the guidelines. I'm not even kidding you about that. You want to read the guidelines. And the reason for that is there is a lot of information in the guidelines that you need to know in order to complete a complete and compelling application. I want everybody um, to be successful. And to be successful, you need to read the guidelines. So please read them, share them with your consultant. Um, they will establish eligibility. They'll tell you about ownership requirements. Um, and uh, importantly enough, they'll go over the evaluation criteria. Uh, so you'll understand how your grant application is being evaluated. It's important to know this so that you can speak to those evaluation criteria in your narrative and the answers to your questions, um, and answers to the questions on the application. Uh, we also provide definitions of the project types. So we went over those, um, but there um, is more detail located in your guidelines. Um, you will also find our funding priorities, which we talked about, and your responsibilities as the grantee. I wanna make sure you get the grant money if you get the grant, but there's things you gotta do. So make sure you read the guidelines. And finally, deadlines. You wanna know when the deadline is? I'll tell you in a minute <laughs> when the deadline is. It's March 29th, okay. So make sure you read the grant guidelines. I'm not even kidding. Okay, so um, we want to receive your pre-application as soon as possible. Uh, we will evaluate your pre-application. We'll turn it around for you, usually within hours. If if for some reason you submit a pre-application and you don't hear from us within like 24 hours, please email us at, um, and I'll have the email addresses at the end of the presentation, but email us at grants at preservenys.org or you can email me directly. Um, sometimes things happen. Uh, so I don't want to miss any pre-applications. So get your application in nice and early so I can take a look at it. Um, be sure and summarize your project in that pre-application in a way that, uh, you know, be sure you provide a good summary of your project. You're going to need to do that in the complete application as well. So we want to know what you're thinking as far as your project. Um, and then if everything checks out with, with your pre-application, I will give you the consultant list along with the link to the full application. If you would like a consultant list before then, which is totally understandable, uh, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to send it to you ahead of time. Make sure you talk to your consultants early. Uh, these folks get really busy this time of year for some reason. So, uh, make sure that you're um, calling up consultants and seeing if they would be willing to do this project for you if you get your grant. Um, uh, discuss your project with them. Make sure they understand the guidelines. Uh, the consultants that are uh, on our list of consultants are pretty familiar with our grant process, but sometimes things change. So um, please provide them a current copy of the um, grant guidelines so they understand what we fund and what we don't. And then make sure that they provide to you uh, their resume, their scope of work, and their breakdown of fees. You're going to need these things for your grant application. 
and you'll find more detail in the application itself, itself as far as what we're looking for here. Uh, but those are the three things you're going to need from your consultant. All right, so photos. Photos are important. Uh, like I pointed out, photos can show the context of your resource. For cultural resource surveys, we want to see uh, sweeping street views um, it, and individual noteworthy buildings that you're hoping to focus on. Um, choose a nice day with good lighting. Try to put your best foot forward. Um, uh, with the photos, we're looking for your best and your worst. We want to see clear centered, good photos of your resource, but we also want to see what's wrong with it. Why do you need this Preserve New York grant uh, so badly and why do you need it now? So if you have issues with your billing, be sure and highlight those in your photos as well. Uh, make sure these photos are good quality. Please don't cut the top of your building off or, you know, take good photos, do well. Um, start with at least one overall view and then narrow in on your areas of concern. Um, and uh, we do require captions and photo credits. So if somebody else takes your photos, be sure you put your name there or their name uh, and credit that photo. If you got the photo from uh, your consultant, sometimes consultants will come by for a site visit. They'll take great photos. If you want to use those, you're more than welcome to uh, as long as your consultant agrees to it. But be sure and credit them in your photos. OK, you want to make sure because we will use these photos later. Where do you think I got all these photos of this presentation? So, you know, we need to know. Um, where you got these photos. So um, please, please don't use Google Street Views. I've seen that happen in applications. <laughs> Just don't, do not use Google Street View photos for your photos. That's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. Um, and then, you know, always consider that uh, your photos are, are painting an important picture of your site, the context. Uh, we may or may not have ever visited your site. So please, Submit good photos. All right, preview your application. Uh, once you log into Smarter Select, you will have the opportunity to do so. And we'll go over that in detail in just a moment. Uh, yeah, read through it. Compile your uploads. If you don't understand something, call me. This The application is entirely online. We don't accept um, emailed applications any longer. Um, we do accept letters of support mailed uh, directly to our office. But aside from that, all of your materials need to go through Smarter Select. Uh, so if you're not sure if you're or if you're intimidated by it, by all means, give me a call. I'd be happy to share my screen and walk you through the process. That's not a problem. All right. So once you have submitted your pre-application um, and you've received your link to the full application, this is the page that that link will take you to. So you might notice that it's asking you to sign into your account. If you've never applied uh, for a preservation league grant through Part Smarter Select, you don't have an account yet, so you need to create one. Their form defaults to the sign-in page, so be sure you go over where I have that green arrow and click on Create New Account and Create Your Account. They give you the option of creating an account with any email address and a password, or you can sign in with Google or create your account through Google. Whichever one you do, remember which one that you do because if you try to sign in the other way, it won't work and then you'll be confused. So if you create your account one week and then weeks later, go back to it and try to sign in another way, it won't work. And I don't want you to freak out. So make sure that when you create your account, you write down your credentials. Um, if someone's helping you with your grant application, like your consultant or a grant writer, um, then you know feel free to share your login with them so that they can work on it with you, but make sure of a few things first. Make sure that you, as the applicant, the applicant organization, make sure you are instigating this Smarter Select account. You should be the one to create the account and to access the application first. The reason for that is that if your grant writer or your consultant does that, once they're in the Smarter Select system, if they apply on behalf of another organization next year, their information is going to be the same as it was this year for you. And that creates a lot of confusion on our end. So please, please, as the applicant organization, please instigate your Smarter Select account and your application, and then invite your, you know, your helpers to help you with the application that way. Okay, so you really got to do that, this part yourself. If you have questions, let me know. 
All right, then, then you will be taken to this page. And this is a summary of the Preserve New York grant program, a little description. This does not replace the grant guidelines. This is a, a condensed version. So be sure you read the guidelines in addition to this, but this just reminds you of what you're applying for and what the requirements are. Now you'll see near the bottom of the screen, there's a tiny little blue underlined preview. Um, you can click on that uh, and preview the entire application. You can even print it out to share with your board or share with your grant writer or whomever. Um, but this allows you to preview the application before you begin printing, uh, filling it out. It's, this can be really useful to help you get your thoughts together about the application. So please use that. Um, it, it'll just make the application process go more smoothly for you. Um, and then when you're ready, hit the green button and start applying. Um, be sure and save your work on a regular basis as you go through the application, just in case there are any technological glitches, you don't wanna lose your work. Um, there'll be little save buttons at the bottom of each section. Um, do that and then uh, feel free to step away from your application and come back to it at any time to continue work. So you can do that through Smarter Select. All right, so in your application, uh, you will have short answer questions, multiple answer questions, and you will have um, some narratives. So uh, make sure that in your project description and uh, your narratives that you are addressing the three criteria that we will be using to review your application. These are spelled out in the guidelines for you, but let's discuss them just briefly so that you're familiar with what they are. So when we look at your application, we will be evaluating it on three criteria. The first of which is historic preservation and project quality. So what do we mean by that? Uh, we are looking at the architectural and historic significance of your building or resource. Um, we are looking at the appropriateness of your project, your budget, and your consultant. So making sure that it all makes sense. Um, is the consultant uh, qualified to do this kind of preservation planning study for you? Does the budget make sense? Are they charging the right amount of money for the amount of work involved? Um, how appropriate is the project for your resource and your organization? Is this a good time to do it? Is it timely? Um, is it urgent? Uh, we you know, will be looking at the likelihood that significant restoration or planning work will result from this preservation planning grant. So we're taking a look at your organization saying, well, you know, it, what is your track record with regard to stewarding this site? Um, what is your plan? Do you have a solid plan? Do you seem to have your act together um, sufficiently to be able to um, drive this project forward after your preservation planning study? So um, looking at that historic preservation and project quality is first. Um, these three criteria are equally weighted. Um, so we're looking at all three. So the second is fiscal and managerial. So uh, we're looking at your organizational budget for starters and make sure that you're operating uh, in a sustainable manner as an organization. Uh, we're, we'll be looking at your ability to carry out the project within a stated schedule. So have you received grants before? And do you have a track record of completing grant funded projects on time and within budget? Um, uh, do you have a solid plan and the ability to raise funds to complete the project? We look at a number of things. Uh, your um, your organizational budget, uh, what kind of uh, um, public outreach you do, how much project support you have from the public, things like that. Um, we're also looking at how well this project fits in with your long-term or strategic plan. So organizationally, are you ready for this project? And uh, finally, we look at the application itself. Is it a good application? Is it complete? Is it compelling? So that's on you as the applicant organization. Um, your fiscal and managerial skills there um, will hopefully provide a complete and compelling application. Now that said, I'm always happy to provide technical assistance, uh, filling out your application, you know, as far as answering questions, how to navigate Smarter Select, what things to consider, how to answer questions. One thing I cannot do is preview uh, your application for you. So, um, but I can answer your questions at any time. So uh, please don't feel intimidated by the application. Call me if you need to, we can discuss it. 
Um, and finally, the third criteria that we will be reviewing your application on is service to the public. This is extremely important. Uh, the, the, one of the main points of a preservation planning grant is to preserve historic resources for public access and um, also for arts and cultural uses. So we'll be looking at things like your public interpretation of the building or resource. Um, it's vis-a-vis uh, -vis its, its architectural and historic resources. So how are you interpreting these things to the public? Um, what's the public access to your historic resources? Um, you know, is the public invited in? Is it accessible? Is it open? Um, for uh, site-specific projects in particular, for cultural resource surveys, the rules are a little different. Um, so uh, we are looking for the benefit to your community or neighborhood and a clear connection to arts and culture. So that's what we're looking for, for cultural resource surveys um, regarding service to the public. For all projects, including cultural resource surveys, we're looking at the degree of local project support. So this can be in the form of support letters. Um, primarily, they are optional in our application. That doesn't mean you should, should ignore them necessarily. We just want good quality support letters. We want these to be good. Um, so be sure you reach out early uh, and ask for support letters. Uh, while we're on the topic, what makes for a good support letter? Uh, so you you can certainly feel free to provide a template to people and say, look, uh, here's a template, please personalize it. What I don't like to see is applications with five support letters that all say exactly the same thing. And they clearly just took the template and stuck their name on it and sent it in. So, um, you know, be sure you're reaching out and you can even offer suggestions. So if it's someone, for instance, who has attended your programs and events in the past, uh, be sure that they refer to that. Um, but uh, support letters are important from um, elected officials, uh, assembly people, mayors, but also super important from friends and neighbors, people who uh, who benefit from your organization and what you have to offer. School teachers who bring their classes to your museum or uh, people who uh, turn to you for the arts and cultural programs that you offer. So we want to see all different kinds of support letters. They should be sincere, they should be heartfelt, and they should be personalized. So uh, this can only help your cause. Um, for cultural resource surveys, you can turn to the community for support letters. If you're not sure you really want to do that yet, <laughs> you know, before you begin your survey and your, your true public outreach that is a requirement um, of cultural resource surveys, then um, you know, get the support of neighborhood organizations, um, your city or town, um, things like that. So uh, service to underrepresented communities. I mentioned that briefly uh, when talking about funding priorities. Um, this can include projects that uh, identify and preserve histories, culture, and places associated with underrepresented communities. A definition, just so that you're clear on what we mean by that, a definition of underrepresented communities is included in your guidelines. You will find them in this blue box on page two of your guidelines. So please read through that carefully and see if you, you know, see if your project meets uh, any of those of those guidelines for underrepresented communities. It's important. Um, and if it doesn't, consider how it might. All right. So in your narratives, uh, so those are the three criteria. If you have any questions about those, historic preservation and project quality, fiscal and managerial or service to the public, please let me know. They're all extremely important to your application. We wanna see uh, that your application speaks to all three of those. Uh, in your uh, narratives and questions, you will be asked to describe your programs, your facility, uh, your mission, make sure that uh, we understand who you are and what you do organizationally and how your mission relates to your use of building or resource. Um, be sure you you understand what part of our of your project we are funding and uh, make sure your your consultant understands that as well because we'll receive a scope of work from them and a project narrative from you. And we want to make sure that they agree with one another. So um, 
and uh, please let us in on the future plans for your building as well. Even though for the purposes of this grant application, the word project refers to your Preserve New York funded project, which is the condition report or the cultural resource survey, et cetera. Um, the overall project, the big view, the big picture, we do want to get an idea of what you have planned. So be sure and include that in your um, project description as well. All right, so I've mentioned budgets a couple of times. We ask for two budgets in your application, the first of which is an organizational budget. So this is a statement of the applicant organization's finances for the current fiscal year. If your budget has not been approved for the current fiscal year, we will accept last year's budget um, and everything that you know about this year's budget so far. Uh, but we're looking for income and expenses. Uh, we hope to see um, exactly where your 20% match is coming from. So keep in mind that that should come from you. Uh, whether you apply for a different grant to get that or if it's um, from donations or it's from your operational uh, budget or whatever it is, we want to see that you've got that 20% match ready to go. Um, municipalities, uh, we do not want to see your 52 page municipal budget, please, please, please. Only submit a one or two page summary of income and expenses for the department that's in charge of overseeing the grant application. So yeah, it should be short and sweet and it should show where that 20% match is coming from. Uh, all right. And if you have any questions, be sure and put it, uh, type it into the Q&A. Be happy to answer any of them while we're here. All right. The second budget we ask for is the project budget. Uh, we're looking for um, the expenses, which should include uh, your consultant fees and really nothing else. So um, how much are you going to pay your consultant to complete this report or survey? Um, the budget's a fairly simple list of income and expenses. Your expenses being your consultant fee, your income being your Preserve New York request, your grant request, your match, and then any other funding sources. So, you know, I mentioned some really large projects, um, maybe Preserve New York won't fund um, most of it. So you have to have other funding that comes in, whether it's from other grants or fundraisers or whatever, make sure that uh, the two numbers agree that your expenses and your income match ultimately. So if you've got a $20,000 project, um, you can ask for up to 80% of that from Preserve New York your match would be 20% of it. Um, do not include any capital expenses or anticipated uh, capital expenses um, for restoration or rehabilitation work to follow. That's, that's not for us, not for this grant. Um, and in spite of the simple aspect of this budget, income, expenses, they should match. Um, your consultant will be required to provide you a breakdown of their project tasks and deliverables and their totals, their fees, their hourly fees, things like that. You should find that in your scope of work. If you don't, call them up and get it. <laughs> Make sure that they provide it. Um, consultants may know that, oh yeah, I can do this project for $10,000 and they'll tell you that, uh, but we need to see a breakdown of that $10,000 and how that all plays out. So that should be included in the scope of work, but your project budget can be a simple you know, income and expenses. If you're not sure about this, or if you get your scope of work from your consultant and that's not quite what you expect, um, you know, I'd be happy to answer questions and help you iron it out. All right. Before we move on, we have a question about consultant fees. So what are generally reasonable consultant fees, um, specifically hourly fees for um, this type of grant writing and overseeing the research. Okay, so please keep in mind that um, grant writing fees are not an allowable expense for Preserve New York. So keep that in mind. Um, we don't want to see that in your project budget. You may have somebody that's being paid to write this grant for you, but that's not something that we fund. Um, your project team, you know, if you have a consultant team and some uh, one team member is working on writing uh, the report and another is doing research, things like that, they may be people with different hourly rates. So you might find that your primary consultant is an, uh, a preservation architect 
and their hourly fee may be $120. And they expect to do four hours of site visit. Uh, so they'll say four hours site visit at $120 an hour. So that's their breakdown of fees. Um, they may have an administrative assistant that works for them whose um, hourly rate is $30 an hour, and they will be in charge of certain research responsibilities or writing. So we expect to see that administrative assistant, $30 an hour, six hours doing whatever. Um, so hourly fees vary widely um, by consultant and by uh, preservation and architect and engineer firms. So I couldn't really tell you exactly what a reasonable rate is, um, but just be, you know, be aware of the, the potentially different rates of different people on your uh, consulting team. I hope that answers your question. It's kind of a non-answer, but um, yeah, we whatever those hourly rates are, just be sure that they're broken out so that we're aware of them. Okay. Oh, if you have a question, just ask. Um, I, I really mean it. So if you do have questions, you can call me, you can email. Um, if you submit a pre-application and you do not get a response within 24 hours, please email grants. Uh, that goes to me and my boss. <laughs> so somebody will get back to you. Um, I want to make sure that uh, your pre-applications are addressed quickly. I make every effort to turn those around then. Sometimes within minutes, sometimes within hours, but I want you to be able to proceed with your application as quickly as possible. All right, I have another question about consultant um, expenses. So are travel expenses allowable? Yes, in state, in state only. So consultant travel expenses are, um, are an allowable expense. Okay, and um, speaking of consultant expenses, um, check out the guidelines. Uh, there is at the bottom of page three of your guidelines, page three, page something, um, you'll find uh, the use of funds. And that's a useful part of our guidelines. They'll, um, they specify that uh, your uh, project costs can include consultant fees and in-state travel, photography, report production costs, and other associated expenses, vaguely enough. Um, so if you're not sure if other associated expenses are included in all that, feel free to ask and we'll talk about it. But yes, in-state travel. All right. So here's your opportunity to ask any questions you may have in the moment. Um, the deadline for applying for Preserve New York is Friday, March 29th. Please keep in mind that the pre-application is only accepted until Friday, March 22nd. Um, try to get it in far earlier than that. Um, you know, last minute applications are very rarely successful applications. So um, please don't wait till last minute uh, to get me your pre-application. I want you to get started as quickly as possible. Um, I am having a, a series of workshops around the state. So if you did not get enough of this today, uh, feel free to come see me in Buffalo, Rochester, Earlville, or Long Island. Uh, I will be in Stony Brook, Long Island this Wednesday. Um, at the Earlville Opera House. Uh, if you've never seen it, you should come on uh, Friday, February 16th. And uh, Tuesday, February 22nd, I will be in um, Buffalo and Tuesday, February 27th in Rochester. So you can, uh, uh, you can register for any of these workshops on our website at preservenys.org. Look for the Preserve New York page and feel free to sign up. Again, this is being uh, recorded, so you will receive a uh, link to it after the fact. Feel free to share it with all your friends or anybody who might be interested in applying for Preserve New York. Please keep in touch with the Preservation League of New York State. Uh, you can do that in a number of ways. Um, I appreciate everybody's uh, attendance today, and uh, I hope you have a good week. Thank you. Bye-bye.